Good afternoon, everybody. This is the um, always the awkward bit of a webinar as we wait for the uh, participants to come and join us. We're now already over 60. So uh, we're going to try and tie in today answering some frequently asked questions on the roadmaps, as well as covering the topic that we wanted to focus on today, which is the pros and cons of going direct versus the agency. So when we get to just over 200, I think you can all probably see the, the number at the bottom, we will, we will kick off straight away by going into what the roadmap looks like and uh, try and go at a bit of a canter through the presentation to make sure that at the end you will have as much time as possible to ask any questions that you may have. Um, it's, 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 it's stopped at 145, so I'm going to give it one more minute to 1502 and then we will and then we will kick off okay so i hope you've all um been able to sort out as many of your customers as you possibly can with the information that you've been given um i know it's very challenging when much of the detail is missing and if you're in scotland or wales we'll cover that in a minute it's even worse uh what it does show though is there is some light at the end of the tunnel. I, I guess we can we can see the tunnel uh, for the first time in a long time and we might even be able to see a little bit of light at the end of it. Um, so we're going to start covering that uh, now. So if we go, we're going to start with the roadmap. I'm going to do that uh, uh, next. Robert is going to just give you an idea of what's happened since the roadmap uh, in England was announced. Just a quick summary of what's happening there. Then we're going to get back on to pros and cons of agents versus direct Beth is going to do the case for the for the for the direct model, and that is going to be answered by Joby, who's going to do the case for the agency model. I'm going to summarise and talk about there's even a hybrid model. So we're going to put the pros and cons of that and try and leave you in a in a clearer position of what your options might be there. And then we're going to go to questions. Questions will be on the main presentation, but also on the roadmap. So without further ado, we're going to start. So the roadmap in England, I will go through England, Wales and Scotland. Uh, so in England, we have three key dates. We have the 12th of April, that's for one household. Um, earlier this afternoon, I put the current government in England definition of one household up on Facebook. So on the past Facebook page, you can go and see what that means. You can ask questions at the end, but I'm not planning on running through the full details of that in the first part of this presentation. On the 17th of May, we go to two households, or rule of six. So there are two ways that you could put together a booking from the 17th of May until the 21st of June. From the 21st of June, there are no limits on guest sizes, guest group sizes in England. There is no tier system from the 12th of April. England is coming out in one tier. That was something we lobbied really hard for because it really doesn't work to have, you know, Devon in tier three and Cornwall in tier one. It's a, it's a shambles. So we're very pleased to hear that. They have said though that obviously if somewhere spikes, like if you remember Leicester was the first place to spike last year, they would put Leicester in lockdown and then guess what? All the tier rules about those bookings would come back into play. Next slide please, Robert. So the key points though to remember on this, these dates are all subject to review. The, 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 the graph of all of the incidences of COVID, the, the, the terribly sad deaths, the people in hospital, the infections, all of those are, are dropping very steeply. If you remember last year when we came out of uh, April, May, June, the graph was quite flat leading us to July. This is a very steep drop off and if that continues we can be assured, I think, that we will get those dates, but those dates will only be confirmed, and I can see James's bean counters and operational guys at the travel chapter having apoplexy at the prospect, seven days before. So all those thousands of bookings can only really truly know they can happen a week before. I, I'm, I'm, you know, if it keeps to come down, if there isn't a, you know, a, 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 a Lithuanian, sorry to anybody who's Lithuanian version of the virus coming out or anything, that really, really spikes it, I think we can look reasonably confidently at those dates. We, we have got, I think, a household definition. We are checking with DCMS because it's the old one, not a current one. 
and the rule of six definition is missing. It's gone walkabout from the government website. So uh, we are chasing DCMS on that. And there are some uh, embarrassed faces around the place, but there is no definition on the website as of this moment. I've got my emails open. If it comes in, I will pop it up on Facebook during the webinar. Uh, shared entrances is um, uh, a complicated one. Um, our interpretation as PASC is that a shared entrance into, say, some lovely flats in Newquay, uh, each property inside was self-contained, would be allowed to go ahead if the entrance was risk assessed and there was a cleaning station each side. Every resident association in the whole of the United Kingdom opposes that view because they don't want the guests coming in and out because they've enjoyed peace and quiet for the last year. So they're in contact with everybody and rather unhelpfully BBC did an interview last night which is going quite viral amongst these groups where the BBC say they should not open. So we are trying to get a sensible clarification on that. So those are the sort of three, uh, uh, three or four big questions on England. If we move on to Scotland, well, it's a complete car crash in Scotland. That's the only way you can describe it, uh, hopeless. Um, no clear dates, review in mid-March. But I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna ask Robert to switch his mic off here and remind us of what happened last year in lockdown one. What happened in lockdown one last year in Scotland, Robert? I wish I could even remember back that far, but um, uh, the dates, dates changed. There all sorts of um, uh, complications around it, this. It started uh, on a Wednesday, if you recall. Yeah. Open you on a Wednesday. Then they brought it back to a Monday, which meant you all had to cancel your bookings and redo them again. And then they brought That's it right. forward two weeks to open ahead of England. So, you know, what you see on the tin is not what you see on the tin until the last minute, particularly with the devolved um, uh, governments, I'm afraid. It's politicking of the worst sort. So Scotland, no information. Uh, so moving rapidly on to Wales. This is the path out of lockdown in Wales, which says that uh, Easter, they're focused on self-contained accommodation and tourist attractions opening in Wales at Easter. I would say that's a less than 1% chance of that actually happening, because what would happen if that actually goes ahead is everybody in England who can't go on holiday at Easter in England will try and cross the border and go and stay in self-contained accommodation in Wales. And the last thing that Mark Drayford, the Welsh First Minister, wants is anybody from England ever going to Wales. So, um, I really can't see that happening. So I'm afraid these devolved administrations are way behind the curve in supporting hospitality. I'm afraid that's been a pattern throughout. Uh, we are obviously pr pr uh, uh, pressuring them in Scotland. The ASSC is all over this with the Scottish government. I have Zooms coming up with the Welsh government and I have a one-on-one -on -one with the uh, uh, tourism minister to try and get some kind of resolution as to what this is. It's really difficult. They're not pro-tourism. Uh, and so when they're not pro-tourism, they're not seeking a rapid answer. So that's the roadmaps. We will answer, uh, you know, there's no more information than I've just given you, uh, but I can try and interpret and answer some questions that you may have at the end. So without further ado, we're going to move on to the um, uh, pros and cons of um, agents and booking direct. But Robert is just going to give you a little picture here of what's actually happening with the bookings as a result of a prime minister saying something, Robert. Well, uh, yeah, it's been interesting couple of days. Um, this first graph here is uh, cancellations going back to October uh, last year. And you can see the spikes, the English lockdown in uh, November, and then also around Christmas with all the uncertainty that we had and quite a lot of last minute cancellations. And then here's our Easter gone <laughs> those bookings that we're hanging on to in late march and early april um last couple of days a spike in cancellations but that's going to be a limited spike given the um the window most people had cancelled up to that sort of easter time anyway um on the other side bookings are through super control in the last uh, since the beginning of the year um the first thing to point out is actually we were all tracking reasonably well uh, this lower line is 2020 bookings, which as at that point last year wasn't really impacted by COVID. Um, but you can see that we were 
tracking reasonably well ahead of where we would have expected to be previous years. But there you go. The last couple of days, massive sort of uh, five, six fold increase uh, in, in bookings. Uh, it, we knew this was going to happen. We knew the spike was going to come eventually. And and here it is. Uh, let's hope that that is um, sustained for a, a period. Of course, most of you on this call have, have probably got fairly full forward availability, uh, fairly full calendars now and have done for some time. And so that uh, uh, we're going to see a really high demand and really short supply, uh, particularly over peak times, but probably for the rest of the, the year and even beyond. So it's really important to get your pricing right uh, this year because uh, that sort of perfect picture of supply and demand gives you an opportunity to make back some of the uh, ground that you've lost in 2020. Uh, so that's that's really just to highlight what's going on. You all know it, you're all get dealing with the bookings, but on a wider level, it's a, this massive spike that we've been hoping for for some time. Okay, Robert, thank you very much for that. Right, uh, we're now gonna go at a canter through the pros and cons of uh, agency bookings versus direct bookings. So to present for the direct. Um, Robert, can I, can I, Robert, can I take the screen please? Cause I've got my presentation. I've, I've changed the slides a little bit. So um, I so, will share my version. Right, are you so, able to see that? So I'd like to just introduce. Uh, are you seeing the screen? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, can you see the stream, Joe? But I can't see what for the guests, but I can see for the, the host. Um, so I'd like to introduce Beth Bailey, who um, uh, owns and runs a holiday cottage in Cornwall called Kernock Cottages. She's been doing them for uh, many years, very successfully, and is a classic exponent of what you can do as an expert if you're on the direct side of things. So without further ado, Beth, tell your side of things. Right, thanks Alistair. Um, right, I think most of us, particularly at the moment, can probably relate to the uh, the image there on the left of the, the, the cat in the hat. If you're doing direct bookings, you have to be an expert in a very long list of things. Um, why do I book direct? I've been doing this for nearly 20 years now, and uh, for me there are a number of reasons. So I have four cottages in South East Cornwall, our USPs are uh, dogs and hot tubs. Um, I want to book direct because um, for me, I, I want to control my costs. I also want to have control of my business model. So th there are obviously various different agency models, but I want to set my own pricing, my own terms and conditions. Um, I also want to own the guest relationship. So, you know, if you book with um, some of the, with, with Airbnb or booking.com or some of these, the guest is not your guest. They, the guest does not belong to you and often you don't get the, the, the guest information. So I want to own that guest relationship, not least so that I can, and can create a, a, a relationship so I can have, have repeats. And um, the other thing is I want control of my visibility of my product. Um, with a lot of big online platforms, they have very deep pockets and lots of money and big audience. Um, but if I'm one of 6,000 cottages in Cornwall, then I'm not going to be on the front page terribly often. So those are my main reasons. Um, so what do you need to do to be successful with direct booking? Obviously you need a self-catering operation, but that, that goes whether you uh, are going the direct route or not. Um, you then start needing lots of extra things. So you need a website, you need professional photography, um, you need a booking engine, you need a card processor, social media platforms, uh, booking partners, and a huge amount of hard work. Um, I said at the beginning that I want to it, I, I want to book direct for cost reasons. That does not mean that uh, booking direct is cost free. Uh, you need a really good website. Um, the average life of a website is three to five years. Obviously, lots of people do their own um, and things like WordPress are reasonably intuitive. That's not my skill set. So I would rather somebody else did it and I had a really spanking um, you know, good professional website. Um, photography 
you need professional photographs. We all have one of these. We all think we're David Bailey. Save this for social media and for exterior shots. You will never ever get your interiors looking fabulous uh, if you do it yourself on your phone. Um, you need a booking engine if you want to attract direct bookings because you need a book now button on your on your website. Uh, there are lots of different ones for which you'll pay usually an annual fee. Um, and I want one if I'm running my own business, which has lots of functionality and, and, and management uh, capability to help me run the business. Card processing. I know there are lots of people who say, oh, I only take backs and I don't have a problem. The thing is, you never know the, the bookings that you are missing if you only take backs. Um, I, uh, if you look at any of the research, more than 95% of people want to be able to pay by card. And that's only got um, more in kind of COVID land because everyone's watched Martin's money and they all know that if they pay by card, they have some um, consumer protection. So I would definitely, definitely take, uh, take cards. And then you've got promotional costs, which can range from you know, zero if you're really good at social media. Uh, but I wouldn't regard Facebook as a free platform uh, unless you have a very, very big following um, to um, various booking platforms. Um, the two mistakes I see people make a lot is they when they first start off is they say, right, well, I'm, I'm going to market through my website. So they build a lovely, shiny website and they put it online and they wait for people to come. This is not Field of Dreams. Nobody's going to see your website unless you promote it. Uh, and on the flip side, um, what the other thing, mistake people make is that they, they try and put themselves out everywhere and they end up with, with very high costs. So when you're trying to find your, your booking partners, you can end up kissing an awful, awful lot of frogs before you find out what works for you. You really have to look at um, whether a particular platform works, you know, are, are they big enough? Do they have a, do they have a big audience? Uh, if they have a big audience, does that mean you're going to be on page 567 every time someone is looking? Because the big sites don't necessarily always give you the best visibility. Is the site appropriate for you? It's obvious to say, if you don't take pets, don't advertise on a dog friendly website. Maybe less obvious, some of the, some of the subtleties, um, in the past, I've been on lots and lots of websites. I've been on store days and home away and golfing sites and dog sites. Um, I've even tried uh, back in the day, Airbnb. That never worked for me because I am top end premium pricing. And so compared to everybody else on Airbnb in Cornwall, I looked expensive. It didn't work for me. You have to find what works for you and what, what works best with your own individual USPs. So this um, fear of missing out and the scattergun approach, trying to list everywhere, that is not necessarily going to be a successful approach. If you've got one cottage, you only have 52 weeks to sell. This is not a scalable product. If you take out lots and lots of subscriptions to lots and lots of different websites, they might all sell one or two or three weeks, uh, but as a percentage of the revenue they buy you, that is going to be very high. And if it's very high, you're probably better off with an agency. So find the ones that work so you can reduce your costs. And the other thing is there are loads of websites, marketing, self catering out there. Don't always go for the cheap ones. It, I, I'm always kind of slightly skeptical when people on hospitality forums are always saying, you know, is there a free this or a free that or a free the other? I like a free thing as much as the next man, but if you want something that's going to work really well and make your business better, why aren't you prepared to pay for it? Uh, we don't give our cottages away for free. If some, somebody is promising you exposure for 120 quid, you've got to have a think about whether 120 quid is actually going to buy them uh, or give them enough revenue to have a, a decent web designer who's going to SEO it properly, who can market it, who can uh, run the social media, etc. Cheap can be expensive. So just make sure you don't fall for that one and end up on lots of 50 quid and 100 pound platforms, which is a waste of money. And if you are on them, ask them to get your old listings off. They like keeping them on when you don't, re don't pay them because it makes them look like they've got lots of properties. They don't and it can spoil your brand. Really important one, this one, know your booking sources. 
um, this is the key really to being successful. So you've got you've got your 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 cheapest source of guests is your repeats and recommendations. You've got your website, and your website will be fed into from your social media, AdWords, and other platforms on which you advertise. Um, I don't advertise on any of those in the bottom left hand corner. I only do Premier Cottages and uh, Google AdWords and social media. How, if, if you're on lots of platforms, you then got to know who's getting you the bookings. Um, you'll all have, you know, obviously heard of Google Analytics and it's a wonderful thing, but do not solely rely on it because it's not the, the it will never be the, the total picture. And I'll tell you why. Uh, it really depends on where you list, whether they have um, uh, are directing traffic to your website or not. That doesn't necessarily mean they're not getting you bookings. So Premier Cottages, for example, which is the one platform I do advertise on, every cottage is on has its own page. It's got photos, 3D tours, reviews, availability calendars. So someone going to my page on Premier and going, that looks really nice. Oh no, they're not available for the 15th of August. Um, and they go away again. They haven't touched my website, but that doesn't mean they, that Premier Cottages hasn't uh, got me eyeballs. And the third one is, this is why your booking engine is important because if you've got functionality in it, it should be able to help you with this. So I'm with Super Control. I can go in there and say, um, ask for a Premier Cottages report and it will tell me that uh, from the 1st of January, Premier Cottages has got me 26 bookings with a total value of 48,000 pounds. If I didn't know that, then I, I risk making some really bad decisions when it comes to renewing. Um, another thing that Super Control will give, give me is what the customer says, if you enable the, the booking sources, where does the customer say he comes from? This is, is also kind of incomplete because quite often customers think they come via Google, but actually they come from Google to Premier Cottages to, to me. Um, but at least it gives me a, a decent idea. Um, other there is all Premier Cottages as well, because that mostly says stuff like, I saw you in a magazine, which is PR for Premier Cottages. So Kernock Cottages, 100% direct bookings, zero ATAs. It's all social media, Google AdWords, Premier Cottages and repeats. My total cost of marketing is less than 2% of my revenue. Knowing where they come from stops you making bad mistakes. So agency versus book direct. I'd say if you don't want upfront costs, you don't know how to reach an audience, you don't have the time or the inclination to manage bookings, and not everybody does, and that's that's fine. If you're brand new to the industry and you don't know where to start, or maybe if you've got a single cottage with expectations of, of income of you know 15,000 pounds, not very high, you're probably much better off with an agency uh, because you will you will keep more of the money. Um, it's not specifically a single cottage thing, because I know single cottages which make a six digit turnover, but, but low singles or low revenue, um, you probably would be better off because you just won't make enough to, uh, in, in term, you'd have too high a level of fixed cost book direct. On the other hand, if you want to kind of retrain control, own the guest and you're prepared to be actively engaged in, in, in managing your bookings and your process, and you have the time, Self-catering is not about running around on a Friday. You know, it's a full-time job, if, particularly if you've got more than one cottage and you are managing all your bookings. So that's pretty much my, my summary. So I will stop screen sharing and um, hand over to Jody. Okay, now, Jody, case for the agents, pros and cons, please. Robert, are you okay to share the slides again? Thank you, Beth. Okay, so if you can flick onto the next one, Robert. So I'll give a quick intro in terms of who the travel chapter are, um, why you should consider when deciding whether to use an agency or, or go direct, uh, what you should look for and ask for in an agency, and then what are the benefits of using an agency? And I'll try and wrap that up in a quick conclusion for you. Next one. So um, who are the travel chapter? So we're, we're a national agency. Um, our flagship brand, which probably most people are familiar with, is holidaycottages.co.uk. 
Um, we have 14 regional offices across the UK with dedicated teams um, in each of those regions and, and boots on the ground. Uh, we've got over 30 years experience in the industry. We were originally founded in, in North Devon, uh, but since grown to be a, a, a national company. We've got a network of brands, which is a mix of regional brands, which we've grown uh, through acquisitions mainly, uh, and lifestyle brands, which gives us the benefit of being able to reach millions of, of different guests. Uh, we've got over six and a half thousand properties across the UK. And um, we, we work with owners every step of the way. So that's really from kind of early stages when someone may be thinking about purchasing a property all the way through the kind of the, the buying process, the building and, and designing of that property. We will support them to make sure that the property is um, marketed the right way so we can really optimize the performance and, and bookings for them. Next one. So, um, as I mentioned, our, our big flagship brand is holidaycottages.co.uk. We do have a mix of lifestyle brands. Um, so just picking off a couple there, K9, uh, which is focused on uh, pet friendly holidays, dog holidays, uh, big domain, which caters for, for larger properties. And, um, and then some of our regional brands, Peak Cottages in the Peak District, Island Cottage Holidays in the Isle of Wight, Lakeland Hideaways in the Lakes. Um, and as I said, we've, we've grown steadily over the years. Um, in terms of looking at where there's an opportunity and where we know there's high demand um, for, for holidays and we don't necessarily have the supply or the properties there um, and going down the acquisition route enables us to be able to match up to that demand and also help us grow further on, on the organic side. Next one. Um, so what should you consider when um, deciding whether to use an agency or, or go direct? Uh, I think there's three key areas for me. Um, one, the level of investment, which which best touch, touched on to some degree, so I won't go into too much too much detail. Time and, and then knowledge. So I think you know, as I said, best highlighted, um, you know, rightly so that there are some costs, certainly in the early stages when you're wanting to set up your your property listing, be that professional photography, uh, the cost of building a website, um, using a, a channel manager, particularly if you. Are looking for distribution across multiple channels and that's where Robert and Super Control can really play a role. Um, the marketing across some of the larger platforms and OTAs like Airbnb and, and Booking.com, social, Google Ads, they all cost money um, and one thing with an agency, agencies will, will tie this all up together and take care of it for, for an owner. And then time, um, again as best highlighted, time is a, is a big factor. If it's your full-time role, and it's your primary income, um, then you, you should be able to have the time to be able to dedicate towards maximizing the opportunity there in terms of generating as many bookings. Um, just be conscious that you have to respond to all of those booking requests and inquiries yourself. If you don't do it in a timely fashion and you're not accepting bookings, you can be penalized on some of the larger OTAs. Um, they will push you further down the, the search results. So that's one thing to be conscious about. Um, the time in terms of maintaining lots of platforms uh, with the property listing, pricing, and again, handling those bookings. Um, if you are established and you have a good repeat book of customers, that's a really strong position to be in. And, and as, as best described, that's a strong position she's in with her properties. Um, Time-wise, can you make yourself available for guests as well? Um, it's not just in that period before they book the property, but whilst they're in stay as well there will be things that will crop up where they will need support. Um, and then do you have the time to manage cleaners and, and tradespeople? Again, the property is gonna need to be maintained. It's gonna need to be, be clean, uh, clean between guests as well. Next one. And then thirdly, knowledge. Um, so pricing is, uh, is, is quite a significant one that uh, we support all our owners on. Um, and we have dedicated teams in the office that will focus on this. And that can be pricing, uh, tweaking pricing up or down, depending on where the market demands are, um, what kind of insights that we're seeing and, and how comparable properties are performing as well. Um, personalized services, um, you know, uh, most agencies will have local teams that, that can support not only you as the owner, but the property as well. Uh, and again, making recommendations where you can look to improve performance. Marketing expertise, most agencies should have a really clear strategy in terms of where they're going to attract that traffic and bookings directly to your property, which could be a mix of PPC, PPC SEO, display, uh, social. And then regulations and legislation. Um, 
which is quite a significant one over the last kind of 12 months with, with COVID. It's, it's been a really difficult time for a lot of owners to try and navigate through all of those restrictions. I know Alistair through the, the Facebook page on, on PASC gives a lot of information out and a lot of guidance to owners, which is really helpful. Um, and likewise, we've, we've, we've done that with, with our owners to try and help them through this kind of every step of the way. And there's other things like health and safety, insurance, what's the right insurance policies you should be taking out, uh, all kind of key considerations. And then advice on features and furnishing. So what really kind of influences that weekly price and, um, and, and booking? So one thing we know across our portfolio, uh, with, with hot tubs on average, it will generate an extra 15% in the weekly price and an additional five bookings. So we can be there to be, and like most agencies, be there to advise owners on what really sells well in terms of features. And then customer service teams. Most agencies will have uh, customer service teams on hand that can work with guests on a uh, seven day basis. Okay. So if, if you are considering using an agency, I guess what are the kind of key questions that you, you want to be asking? Um, I think firstly, um, are they a national or regional, agents, regional agency? Because there are differences. Regional agencies will tend to offer more localized services than, than larger uh, national agencies. Um, so it's understanding what's the best fit for yourself. Are you um, living close by to your, to your property where you can easily access it? And again, deal with any issues that may arise. I think probably the, the perfect combination is working with a national agency that, that has regional offices and, and staff that can support so you get the benefits of both worlds. Um, what services do they provide? You know, what's really going to suit your requirements? So do you require fully managed services where an agency will take care of um, all of the, the, the changeovers, the maintenance of that property, um, as well as the marketing of that property, dealing with the booking requests, the inquiries, processing the payments. So I think it's really under, to understand kind of what you actually need because they're very different services there that will suit different owners depending on what their circumstances are. Um, what's their marketing strategy and reach? So it, you know, it, it's important to understand how they're gonna generate bookings for you, um, you know, what kind of channels they're using, um, how they're rated on customer service, which I think is more important than ever now um, in terms of how um, they're representing you, uh, your property, um, and I said the level of service that they're providing. And I think there's lots of really good ways that you can you can gain insight around this, uh, looking at the actual property listings on, on their website uh, and look at the, the reviews there, uh, looking at FIFO, looking at Trustpilot, Facebook. So there's lots of really good independent sources there that would give you a lot of insight around that agency. Um, and then what level of support can they provide you? Um, do they have dedicated account managers that can work with you and your property? Again, to maximize performance. Um, do they have internal teams and expertise that can support you on pricing, um, marketing, as I said? And, and do they, are they, if you're not using a fully managed service, but can they signpost you to cleaners and tradespeople that can help support you where required? Um, and then how will they present your property? Because it, it's really, un, really important that they understand uh, your target market, the audience you're looking to attract, because it's very different from a property that maybe one bedroom sleeps two that's looking to attract um, couples versus a property that might have four bedrooms, sleeps eight, and looking to attract families. The features need to be different. Um, the descriptions need to be written in a way that would attract that audience. The photography needs to be set up to attract that audience as well. So those are really important factors. And then finally, the commercial terms. Um, you know, clearly it needs to work with you. The numbers need to, to stack up and, um, you know, it, it, it's an important factor when you're making your decision. Okay, next one, Robert. So um, some of this I've, I've probably touched on. So what are the real benefits? I think one, um, that in-house expertise where um, the, the agency is really focused on, on driving bookings for, for you and your property, the personalized services, you know, having an account manager, that will be able to get to know you, your, your property is really important. Um, some of the regional agencies are probably better suited for that rather than the larger national agencies. Um, having the extensive marketing reach, as I've touched on, um, and Beth touched on, it, it, it could be a lot of cost involved if you're doing it yourself. Agencies can take care of all of that, um, you know, using a mix of different channels. Owner payments, most agencies that will differ from where OTAs are, 
will pay owners in advance. We typically pay our owners three weeks in advance of that holiday. Um, agencies will manage that whole kind of guest experience and queries um, before, during and after their stay. Uh, many agencies will offer that managed service. Um, we offer it in five locations across the UK. Many of the regional smaller agencies will, will, will offer that. Um, it may differ with some of the larger national agencies. Um, having, a, I guess, a, a good reach and a diverse network of, of websites and brands, this mainly kind of suits and fits the, the larger agencies like ourselves, where they may have a mix of regional agencies as well as kind of the big flagships. Um, having local teams and knowledge of the local market, um, I think that's really important. And again, if uh, you have local teams and, and offices there, they will really get to know that, that market and, and the property itself. Having the right tools in place um, to be able to support the owner, uh, where you can look at bookings, the information around the guests, what payments have been made. Competitive commission rates. Um, is it an agency that's been established for a long period of time? Most agencies are, um, and that's important because they have that level of expertise and understanding and knowledge there. And then professional photography, as, as Beth rightly highlighted, it's, it's, it's so critical. It's probably the, the, the one thing when someone lands on, your, uh, lands on your property in the search results that will attract them, whether they firstly click through and, and then secondly book. So it's really important that photography is of first class. Okay, so I think um, just to kind of conclude, there's definitely a place for, for going direct and, um, and, and taking the agency route, but it's really determined by your circumstances and, and what your specific requirements are. And for me, as I said, it, it kind of funnels down into those three key areas. It's the, the, the cost, the, that level of investment to start off with, the time which you can dedicate, and then for, thirdly, the, the knowledge and um, your understanding of the market um, and how to be able to adapt to that. Brilliant. Thank you, Joby. No problem. Thank you. Um, if you pop up the uh, summary slides from me, I'll canter through those and we'll get into the questions. Thank you very much, Robert. OK, so slide coming up now. It's obviously a long way from Scotland to get the slides up. Here we go. Right, next slide, please, Robert. OK, so Really, there are three business models here, actually. Uh, there's the agency model that uh, Joby's just uh, uh, um, described, uh, the direct model that Beth has described, and what I'm just going to describe as the hybrid uh, model in a second. So um, a couple of questions have come in, it's probably worth answering them now, is, you know, do, I, do we see a difference between an OTA and an agency? Uh, yes, most certainly, actually. Um, one, you know, we've talked, talked Joby's said about having regional offices and boots on the ground and people you can talk to. Uh, that doesn't apparently appear to be the kind of experience you get with an online travel agent called Airbnb or booking.com. So, you know, you're going to get a different level of experience here. So the, the hybrid model is one I'll cover a, a bit more in a second, but just wanted to qualify that we certainly regard OTAs and full service agencies as two completely different uh, animals. Okay, so next slide, please, Rob. Okay, now there's, there just is not a golden bullet here. Uh, if there was, we every single person who has properties on this webinar would be doing it in exactly the same way. Okay, so there is no golden bullet. Every, every business is different and there are no shortcuts. So, you know, nobody's necessarily doing it 100% right and no one's doing it 100% wrong. So this is just trying to guide you to make sure you're making the right criteria choices to fit your business. So next slide, Robert. Okay, now uh, Beth gave an exceptional uh, uh, um, case study of what she can do with Kerner Cottages and, and how much that can cost. Uh, I, I used to run with my wife a, a, a business called Holiday Cottage Advice. You can probably guess what it used to do by the, by the title. And you know, getting people to 10% uh, a lot of the time was really, really hard. Now that's, that's you know, not that far off what some people are paying you know, agencies. So you do need to really think about whether this is a money saving reason for going direct. Um, the pain of startup is the next thing I wanted to point out. If any of you are on there are just starting out to actually get the kind of traction that Beth enjoys or that we enjoy with our own business here uh, from startup is 
notoriously difficult. We've got hundreds of reviews we've built up over time. We've got thousands of Facebook followers and Twitter followers and Instagram followers. And we've got somebody who either we know or we know ourselves how to do SEO and Google and Facebook ads. You know, these are not skill sets you'll get on day one. And so, you know, it's really, you know, you've really got to think about what your far forecast you want to get from your business is and how much it's going to cost for you to get there doing it, the direct model, and how much it's going to cost to get there going the agency model. Um, the, the other point I just wanted to cover on this slide is what I do giggle at actually a lot uh, is on the hospitality forums. People talk about getting all their bookings direct via Airbnb and booking.com. That's not what I call direct bookings. They've got no control of the way that product is displayed or listed as uh, Joby alluded to afterwards, you know, you have to tick certain boxes to come up in certain ways on the display. You can't control the terms and conditions and that they're in control of the whole relationship. And if you don't like it, there's nothing you can do about it. With a service agency, you can talk to them. You can get them to help. You could say, as Joby was saying, like, I really want to focus on family groups. And I'm not sure that our listing currently does that right now. And so you're going to get a much better partnership and there's less stock. I mean, Joby, you've got six and a half thousand properties. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Across all those different platforms. Um, we, we don't list all our properties across all of the, no, no, the, no, larger... the total number of properties across yeah. all. Of, right. OK, well, just to say at its peak, uh, Airbnb had 320,000 on Airbnb. So how, that's the point that Beth's made. How do you stand out? So this is why there is a big difference between the, the focused agency and just the big blanket listing sites. So uh, that's a myth of a direct model. Um, why do the vast majority of people choose agents? Because they do. Uh, when we used to run that consultancy, the first question we used to ask was, are you going to take phone calls and answer emails at the weekend? Uh, which most people would go, good Lord, no, I don't work at the weekends. Well, that's not going to work in this modern uh, world that we live in where people are looking for instant response to inquiries. And that's why if, you, if, you're, if you're prepared to do that yourself, then that's a big control thing that you've got. But if you're not, you just won't succeed. I mean, period, full stop. If you're lazy about responding to guests or you're thinking, does you carve the roast beef? You think I'm not taking that call? We always take that call. That's where we get our occupancy from. An agency, a good agency has, I don't know, what hours does a good agency cover at the weekends these days, Joby? Um, I mean, we're open seven days a week, normally from eight till eight. Uh, some periods during the week we'll be open until 10 o'clock at night. So it's, it's yeah. See, and, that's, is, and that's 364 days a year. And, and, and the reason that uh, uh, Joby Travel Chapter and many, many other great agencies are doing that is because the customer, that's when the customer is going to ring. They're not doing it to have people sitting in an office twiddling their thumbs. So you've got to be able to answer those calls, deal with those inquiries quickly. You know, these people aren't sending out one inquiry necessarily. They'll be sending out multiple inquiries. You need to impress them with a good quality response, a speedy response, and answering their questions. So if you can do that, that's a big one. Can we have the next slide, please, uh, Robert? So this decision-making criteria on which way you go, phone calls and emails, is a really, really big one. If, if you can't do it, don't do it. Time. The time that Beth commits to her business is full-time. That's a full-time business for Beth, and that's why it's successful. If you can't do it full-time, you can't do all of the Facebook stuff, you can't keep on top of all of the ways that you can generate all these direct bookings, you may need to think about uh, where you're putting your properties. Investment, this is again the point, I'll make it again that Beth said, if you've got a property that you think you're going to get, say, between 15 and 25,000 pounds a year out of, You've really got to do the maths about whether that's a direct product or an agency product because you've got the website costs, you've got, you've got all those fixed costs. The fixed costs for all of that with one cottage doing 15 to 25,000 pounds isn't that much different from my three cottages, one of which is a sleeps 20. So my scalability is much greater than somebody who has one. Now, if you've just won you know, the most beautifully designed house of the year, and it's been the winner of the Golden Rose Award at the Royal Chelsea Flower Show, you can, you can book direct from now until kingdom come if you've had celebrities come and stay. But not all of us have those breaks or have those opportunities. So you've got to think about horses for courses and market your property. And every past webinar wouldn't be the same if I didn't say it's all about pricing, 
photographs and partners for optimization. And I don't think that anything that Joby or um, Beth has said doesn't actually just in, endorse that as well. So investment is how much money does it cost to get those direct bookings and count your time in that. I mean, you must have some value on your own time. And the last thing is capability. You know, the capability to, uh, to have the kind of occupancy that Beth generates for her own business is down to the fact that she has learned all these skills and made them and honed those and, got, and, and, and can manage that and can do it constantly. The trouble with things like social media and all of this marketing is if you're busy for a month at it and you really build some momentum and then you sort of think, oh, I've got to focus on the garden next month and you stop doing it, it drops off like you can't believe this is a this is a roller coaster direct once you get on you can't get off you've got to do it properly it's very rewarding i'm 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 a i'm a, a, a person that does it here but it's hard work and you have to stick at it you, there's no holidays no holidays at all so that's the kind of acceptance criteria uh, last slide should move us to questions so I'm going to start now banging questions out to the audience. Do keep the questions coming in. Um, I will uh, uh, ping the questions out. Does anybody else want to say something more? Um, um, Joby, you're, a, you're an agency that often probably gets maligned. So what's the difference to you between an agency and an OTA? Uh, it's the services that they provide. You know, we, we will offer a, a full service in terms of managing the inquiries, the bookings, the payments, which I think is an important factor um, uh, and processing all of that on behalf of the, the owner um, and, and, and also managing that whole marketing experience. So as you rightly said, the cost involved in professional photography, you know, building your own website, using booking en engines, channel managers, the cost can start to, to really kind of rack up and, and then you really have to kind of work out, okay, is it worth doing that all myself for one property versus what I might pay, which is a slightly higher commission rate by using an agency and they do all the heavy lifting for me. So I think those are probably the, the, the big considerations. If you've got multiple properties, in, as in your case, Alistair, or in best case, you could make those figures work for you. But I think it really does need to be a big consideration if it's probably one individual property. Um, and um, the net return to you would probably be very, 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 I guess, very little in terms of the difference there. Okay. I think the other the other thing that's kind of slightly confusing for a lot of people is is just the, the vocabulary, because um, a lot of what we now call the OTAs used to be a subscription model. So you typically pay X pounds a year per cottage. And most of them have gradually shifted over to what we call an agency model, it really a commission model. So th that's why there's a kind of blurring in, the, in uh, blurring of definitions in people's minds between agency and OTA, but a, a, a classic agency does a lot more than an OTA would. Robert, you're, um, uh, uh, you have holiday cottages yourselves. Um, I've, I've seen them, lovely. Oraland, anybody wants to go to beautiful Southwest Scotland. Um, you use both the direct model and the agency and the OTA model? Yeah, um, so we, uh, I don't know whether we fit into your hybrid model or not, but we are very similar to a lot of other uh, businesses out there, uh, obviously knowing a lot of super control clients and, and how they operate. So, yeah, we have our own website. We take a large proportion of our bookings from repeat guests uh, and and direct bookings, people that find us uh, uh, just searching. But we also use... Uh, OTAs, like m many people on this call, and and I see that as a very uh, useful way of advertising our properties. Um, which Beth, well, both Beth and Joby have spoken a lot about the time it takes. Well, um, we don't have a lot of time to spend on our self-catering operation, but we also like to keep control of, of, the, of the operation as well. And so using OTAs is a very useful way for us take bookings without putting effort into social media, without putting effort into our, our, our own direct marketing efforts. So uh, it works very well for us. The um, cost of a direct booking is, is you know, Alice, you put a figure of 2%, uh, of 10% on that, Beth, sort of uh, lower, but there is definitely a cost to a direct booking. So the gap 
between a direct booking and an OTA booking is is not as significant as people might uh, think. The, the cost of that um, OTA booking at let's say fifteen percent is is n not uh, uh, as significant as it might be uh, as you might think. So yeah, that works very well for us where we have not a huge amount of time to spend on our property uh, on marketing in particular. But yeah, we will. We will pick up the phone to that inquiry, whatever time, live chat on the website, all of those things. You've, you've got to be there for, for to, and responsive. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, we have fallen into the trap, uh, uh, presenters, of jargon, um, and we, we must avoid that. I can't stand it with people. OTA is an online travel agent. OTA is an online travel agent. We've got used to using that jargon an online travel agent, that, and that would be what we've classified on here would be a booking.com, an Airbnb, a VRBO, those kind of things we call an online travel, travel agent, and we call a serviced, full service um, self-catering agency, travel chapter. That gives you your definition there. Um, I've got a lovely question in here from Vicky, who I, 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 I've had lots of correspondence with over time. Hi, Vicky. Are OTAs not highly regarded within PASC? The answer to that is no, they're not, not at all. Um, I wouldn't have, you know, any time for them personally, the way they behaved during the lockdown. Recently, we've seen them uh, being caught out again, taking illegal bookings. Um, I really, they don't help me lobby on your behalf uh, up in London and in Wales to get you open, to get you open safely, to get your restrictions reduced. As they continue to break all the restrictions, it really doesn't help. So the answer is no, no time for them at all. Um, what does Alistair mean by partners? Partners are partners are plat where you where you where you who you work with to get your bookings. So if you if you've got great photographs and good prices and a good partner, that good partner could be could be travel chapter, uh, it could be probably cottages, it could be um, many of the other uh, 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 places out there. If they're doing the right job for you and you've got the right relationship with you and you've got your partnership your photographs and your prices perfectly aligned, you will get the optimum amount of business that you can get. That's what I mean by that. Uh, Joby said photographs. Beth says photographs on every opportunity. Robert would agree that photographs are the absolute killer. You know, that's the money to spend. Obviously, you can't make a mongrel look like a pedigree dog, even in the case of mine that's in behind me here. You know, you've really got to make sure that what you're taking a photograph of is reflecting what you're targeting. Again, echoing what Joby said, if you're aiming for the romantic couples market, you know, Lego sets and stuff in the corner is probably not going to help. But if you're aiming for the family market, having stuff for the kids so they don't have to bring stuff in the car would be stuff that you could have in the mix. So, you know, you've really got to get your photographs your, and your partner's marketing uh, absolutely aligned in order to get the bookings right. Somebody like Joby's team would be looking at the pricing. I'm afraid when you go to the very, very large agencies, the very large ones, the sites, the cottages, they're more like distribution houses, clearance houses. Uh, I can tell you the pricing that you, if you come out of those and you went to Travel Chapter or you went to Premier Cottages, both those people would say, we can do better than that. So they're distribution rather than uh, optimum pricing. So you, you, again, you've got to look at what kind of partner you're looking with. So that's what my partner's pricing and photos means. You get those aligned and you'll have a really successful business. Um, Tracy has asked, do all agencies put a number, a limit of the number of owner bookings? Owner bookings is a big topic for agents. So I'm going to point that directly at Joby. Owner bookings. How many can they have? Can they have any? Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on the individual owner and, again, their, their circumstances. And I think, you know, we, we like to try and work in partnership with, with our owners where we can we can optimise the performance and generate them the best possible return. In order for us to be able to do that, we want as many weeks as we possibly can to, to sell. Um, so we, we try to work with, um, with our owners, establishing what their needs are. So if they want to use the property themselves, how frequently they want to use that property versus... Um, the opportunity for us to be able to sell it and for them to understand how we can um, really drive performance and the best possible return for them. So it, it really depends on the circumstances of the owner, understanding what their requirements are, 
and I would imagine most agencies will will work on that basis as well. And most agencies will be flexible um, and be able to cater for most owners' needs. Okay. Um, someone's asked, what's the difference between Premier Cottages and Travel Chapter? Beth, would you like to answer that one? Um, yes, well, Premier Cottages is not an agency and it's not an OTA. We are a membership cooperative uh, of owners that get together to jointly market their properties. Um, a lot of them are professional self-caterers and, and, and that's their only source of income. It's been going for over 25 years. Um, a, a very significant database of over 150,000 and uh, nearly 150,000 Facebook followers. And that's to market only 800 cottages. And this is what I was talking about in terms of, of visibility. We have a very big audience, but we don't, we're not trying to sell 220,000 cottages like um, a lot of the OTAs are. Um, uh, but we are niche, we're top end um, uh, graded properties. Okay. Um, a point, it's not really a question, it's a point. Our agency OTA commissions rates far too high. I think we tried to kind of cover that, that with the myth that, you know, direct bookings are in any way free. I mean, we've tried to, um, you know, not in any way make you not want to sell your pro product directly, just to uh, illuminate how much it can cost. Um, and I said to you that, you know, for an average small complex, it's, it, they're doing well at 10%. So suddenly you start realizing that you wouldn't have to do the social media, you wouldn't have to pay for the photography, you wouldn't have to spend as much time. So this is why it's down to personal choice and personal criteria about what works for you. You know, I think, I mean, I, you know, the, 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 the old days of everybody uh, having, you know, a flat rate on commission are long gone. When I first came into this game, all the agents in Southwest England miraculously all charged exactly the same percentage. That's long gone. You know, if you've got the right product and you work with the right team, you can get a good deal. A good deal isn't necessarily a low percentage. A good deal is how many bookings they get you and how much money they earn you. So this chase that many people do of ringing around the agents to see who'll offer the lowest commission possibly isn't the best way to go out with your shopping trolley. It's what they can deliver for you overall in the mix. So, you know, it's it's not a simple game. As we said, it's not a golden bullet uh, to do it. Um, I'm going to try and find some other questions uh, here to ping out. Um, <clears throat> Beth, nervous about going direct after being with an agency? What would you say? So these are, I mean, we, uh, Joby, just to explain, we get loads of people coming out of particularly the, the big sites and cottages.com after last year's um, debacle. Um, what would you, what would you say to there, Beth? What's, you know, again, we're back to the size of their business really, isn't it? It, it is. And, it, and, you know, a lot of people coming out of, for example, sites will have a, a, a single cottage. Everything's typically been managed for them and they won't have, uh, a lot of expertise in running social media, etc. Um, if it's not your main income and you don't want to spend a huge amount of time, you, you may well be better off with a local agency who knows your area. Uh, I, I'm not talking about you know, a nationwide site because I'm talking much more along the lines of something that Joby was talking about, a specialist agency who can, who can operate the uh, the, the business and get the reach for you. It is a lot of work trying to do the whole lot direct. So the danger is that it can consume your life for uh, a relatively, you know, you, you'd be getting far less than you would if you were stacking shelves at Tesco's. If you're uh, trying to self-manage, I can see someone here is talking about their uh, £7,000 revenue cottage. Um, I wouldn't go direct on that one personally. I think just, just to add to that as well, I think you know, all agencies, yes, yes, they may offer very similar services, but um, they, they operate differently to, to, to some extent. So your experience of working with one, one agency may, may be very different working with another agency. And I would always recommend, um, you know, meeting with two or three different agencies, get a sense and feel for the services they can provide, the people there. Can you work with them? You know, are they a right fit for you in terms of a partnership, as Alistair mentioned earlier on? Um, you know, do you feel they will represent your property in the, in the right way? And most agencies will come out free of charge, no obligation, talk you through what they can offer, offer you revenue projections. So what's the likely return, how many weeks that they feel that they can fill, and then you can make an informed decision. You know, so I would, I would really recommend, in, you know, meeting with a, 
a range of different agencies and, and getting a sense and feel as to what's going to be right for, for you. Okay, there's a question come in uh, from uh, uh, Annie who says, we would like to use an agency to take some bookings for a single cottage, but the agents insist on taking a high proportion of bookings and not allowing many owner bookings. I think you, you, you've got to be realistic when you're going into a partnership. If you're, if you're, if you're saying we'd like to uh, take all the best bookings uh, ourselves and leave the agency with, with filling the shoulder months in the winter, they're not going to put as much effort behind you as if they are able to get some of the cream themselves. I mean, this is a, a partnership. Uh, any one of these things is a partnership and it needs to have, there are two sides to a partnership. So don't go and ask an agent to, to, to just, um, uh, don't freeload on an agent because they're not going to do it. I wouldn't do it if I ran an agency. I wouldn't say, you know, um, I only want you to take the November and, 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 and early March weeks. I can do the rest myself. Why would they do that? They don't want to, they want to make sure that they can offer their customers the widest choice too. So you've got to get the balance right. It is difficult if you've only got one cottage because you don't have the same routes to market, if you like, that we had with multiple cottages because we can spread the cost, but you can still do a good deal with the right kind of uh, agent. Uh, someone's asked, what's the difference between um, uh, someone like independent cottages uh, are they an OTA or an agency? Beth, independent cottages, are they, they an ind what are they? Um, if you don't know, I can do it. I'm trying to spread the question. Oh, no, you, you do do that one because I'm just trying to get my head around uh, which group that is. Everyone they are, their names. They're, a, they're a private listing site. You pay to advertise on them. They get great feedback from uh, members within PASC. So you just pay a fixed fee for your listing. No, no interference in the bookings. They encourage people to book direct and they provide a click through to your website. There are still some sites like that, way less than there were years ago. And as Beth said, you've got to look at, you know, I'm not gonna get into naming too many names, but there's some shockers out there that have been around for years that leave properties on there, um, you know, year after year and try and get people to renew under the most spurious of things. If somebody's trying to charge you 50 quid for a listing, You've really got to wonder how much that 50 quid is going to impact their marketing budget to generate you very many bookings. I mean, realistically, you'd be better off doing a couple of good posts on Facebook and putting 20 quid between each behind your best photograph. You'll get more bookings than that than you ever will from a 50 quid site. You, you either make a partnership and you invest in it or don't would be really, I think, the advice of the whole panel here. Um, uh, Anonymous attendee, I love you. That's very secret squirrel. So we've got we've got a James Bond or a female version these days. Got to be gender neutral. But what if an agent isn't getting the bookings for you? What if if somebody and it must have happened at least once in the history of of holiday cottages.co.uk. What do you do if someone's not happy with the level of bookings? What's your what 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 do you try and do for them, Joby? What's the what's the recourse? Yeah, I mean, we will. There's a number of different levers, and we're trying to understand why to start off with. Um, is it is it the pricing? Is it priced too high? Um, is it the photography? Are we presenting the property in the right way to the right target audience? Is the quality of the photography, you know, of the of the right standard? So, I think we look at a, a, a number of different factors to try and understand what might be driving that that performance. But, you know, I think I think ultimately the way that we kind of operate, we. We, we, we know where our sweet spot is in terms of the, um, our portfolio, the typical range of properties. We, we only operate at the quality end of the market where we know those properties will perform. Um, so we, we back ourselves that, that we will generate bookings. We will generate a good return for our owners. Yes, correct. In some instances, not every single time we're going to perform, but that's when we will dive a little bit deeper to understand the data that sits behind that and look at the levers where we can try and improve performance. But Ultimately, you know, there will be instances where it won't work for one reason or another, um, but we try to avoid that at all costs. Do you, I mean, a lot of agencies um, uh, put the product, uh, the, the, the owner's product onto multiple other sites, like they list them on Airbnb and booking.com and, and numerous other places. Is, is that something Travel Chapter do? Um, I think we work slightly differently to a lot of the other larger agencies. I, I can't really kind of, comment too much on what their strategy is but over 90 percent of our bookings um come direct through our, our own marketing mix whether that be through seo through ppc 
Uh, we're running TV and, and, and radio campaigns at the moment to drive traffic to our websites. We do use affiliates. Um, we do use OTAs um, from time to time, but we, we don't actively use Airbnb or Booking.com, for example. And as I said, we, we tend to push a lot of our kind of marketing bucks behind our, our own activities to drive traffic to our, to our website. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, right, I'm going to start uh, going through, so there's, there's one I will just pick up and then we'll move on to um, some of the questions uh, uh, about uh, bookings um, coming up with the, with the roadmap. So I'm just gonna go back up to uh, start to make sure I've got those. Um, Robert, um, I, I get asked this a lot, but PASC, um, could Super Control add Stripe to the card processing while I scroll up to the other questions? Could you add Stripe? Uh, so Stripe is a, uh, a, a sort of card processor um, that is relatively low cost. Uh, we have actually looked at, at adding Stripe uh, during 2020. Um, they weren't so keen, actually, working at uh, scale in the holiday rental sector, but of course that was during 2020. Um, what we did do is made a significantly better uh, arrangement with uh, holiday rent payment or, or Yapstone to uh, drive down costs and uh, provide a much better experience through that. And we're doing a lot of work on their integration right now. Um, so it, at the moment, doesn't look like Stripe is, is an option, but we do have a very, very good alternative with lots of improvements coming there. And we have a question about, obviously, someone who's looking at this. Uh, what, what, would, what would a card payment, what, what's the kind of transaction cost there these days? When you're saying you've got HRP down, you know, what are you, what are you trying to, what are you looking at? What are we looking at? Uh, so it depends on your volume. Uh, if you're... Uh, as one of the uh, questioners said, talking about a sort of seven, ten thousand pound turnover, you're not going to get the cheapest rates. Um, but anywhere from one percent up to about two and a half percent is the sort of range. And if you're putting through a lot of volume, but perhaps not as much as as uh, some people think. So uh, definitely willing to have conversations around that for those of you who are super control clients. Um, the Incidentally, it looks like there might be some changes in card uh, transaction fees for cardholders coming from the EU, one of the sort of first things directly impacting us from Brexit. So towards the end of this year, you'll start to hear a lot more about that, uh, which could start to have a bearing on some of the, the uh, processes that, that we're all using. Okay, right. Um, questions on the roadmap. I've got quite a few here. Um, can we have it confirmed that a support bubble is classed as one household in England for stays from the 12th of April? If you go back to that first slide, from the 12th of April, you can have one household or one household bubble in a, in a self-contained accommodation in England. We have no announcement on Wales and Scotland. The uh, full links to the uh, government website are on the Facebook past page. I put it up about an hour and a half before this call. So it's one household or one household bubble. Um, we've I just... think the important thing to point out there, Alistair, is that a household bubble is very specific. And lots of people are saying, oh, well, I'm in a childcare bubble with both of my parents. That doesn't count for holidays. It's only a support bubble under the definition. Okay, so that's all on the, the website. I have uh, I got a partial response on rule of six from DCMS during this call. Um, Alistair, you can reassure people not to interpret the guidance as any change or restriction. This is the rule of six. Uh, as it says, it's actually more flexible and more social contact than we had before, either six people from different households or a group comprised of two households. So this, you can have post the uh, um, 17th of May, you can have two households or a rule of six, whichever booking suits the way that you want to construct it. Okay, so that's... And the two households can be more than six, so you could yeah. have eight or 10 or 12 people. Yeah, so I mean, two households were so much more uh, 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 able for businesses to operate in last year from the 4th of July to the 11th of September than the rule of six was or whatever. You can have the rule of six because it means you can have people from more than two households, but in a smaller group. 
So you can see how you can flex the, the, the bookings. Um, going down long term. Do you think accommodations will go down the no jab, no stay route? Who wants Joby? Right, I'm going to throw that one straight at you. What do you think? I don't think so. No, no. I think it'd be, you, you're kind of discriminating a little bit, aren't you, against the, the wider kind of population. Um, I also think self contained accommodation is probably the safest kind of accommodation you can stay in versus uh, uh, other types of accommodation, be it hotels, B&Bs, etc. So I, th I think it's a very safe environment for people to take a holiday, and, and I don't think it will go down that route. So you're not thinking that all 6,500 travel chapter owners will be standing at the top of the drive with a testing kit and a thermometer then? <laughs> I don't. I don't. You don't, you don't. Uh, well, the, the other problem with that is if we're opening on the 12th of April, then your, your guests would only be able to be the over 50s. Yeah, very true. Yeah. Okay, Robert, uh, any, any thoughts on... on jab to come and play completely unmanageable but it's important to realize that we've already spent the whole summer last year welcoming guests when there was no uh eject injections available um most people on this call have completely changed their cleaning protocols yeah. thanks to uh, the work put in by PASC to, to help support that so you know if we are a safe in uh, a safe sector and, and thankfully, we're opening before some other accommodation sectors because yeah, of that work. That's, that's, that's proof, of the, proof in the pudding. I'm, I'm, again, I have slightly mixed feelings. I, I think the 12th of April to the 17th of May will be an interesting period because the guests won't be getting anything like the guest experience that they will be hoping for because they'll have to eat outside in part-time tents strung on the side of tarpaulins outside pubs. Uh, but so many people will have breakout fever that I think that the bookings will still come. Um, has anything said about the opening of indoor pools? Uh, I, I think indoor pools will be open uh, from the 12th of April on the proviso that you operate what you did last year, which was exclusive use on a rotor basis. Um, again, the devil will always be in the detail. We're trying to flush out all any changes. But if you look on the uh, roadmap graphics, uh, it, it does say you can do uh, indoor indoor pools, um, and it specifically says that indoor spas, where it's much more shared stuff, can't open until step four. So uh, our interpretation is that indoor pools can open from the 12th. Um, moving on again, um, partners, OTAs. Uh, what is the current view between having breaks between bookings? Robert, you, you were involved when we were writing it, and I'll come to you on this one, Beth. This is people taking three days between, between bookings. What do you think? Yeah, so we added some functionality at Super Control because uh, a number of clients wanted to put a break, one, two, or even three days in between bookings. Um, and if you want to do that, and if you feel that that's appropriate, then by all means, but with the correct cleaning protocols, uh, I do not think it is necessary. It is just gonna kill your opportunity to earn revenue from your properties. Um, but yeah, if you want to do that, uh, then by all means, but it is not a requirement, never has been, and I don't feel it's necessary. Okay, you, Beth, you, you helped write the uh, protocols with the ASSC and PASS. What, uh, What's your yeah, from, it, from a COVID protection of the consumer point of view, it's absolutely not necessary. I know there are some owners who are very nervous, uh, and if, if it makes you happy to leave a gap, by all means do. But as Robert says, you will be minimising your uh, revenue opportunity at possibly the best revenue generating period that you will ever have again. So, uh, you know, it's quite a big commercial decision to... to decide to leave a 72 hour gap or, or, or a several day gap. I would Alistair, as, as you pointed out earlier on, well last year, um, is the taxi being uh, set on, set aside for 72 hours between every passenger, is the bus seat, is, you know, the hospital it bed is not, is not left for 72 hours. Exactly. But again, you know, this is down to individual choice. We did a survey last year and at the peak of opening last year, I think 15% of people who filled in the survey said that they were uh, leaving an extended gap between 
changeovers. Now, this is if this continues, and with people who aren't opening this this year, which is another percentage, you know, we're going to have lower capacity, and lower capacity is not not actually terribly beneficial in 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 my view this year. It's going to cause huge spikes in prices. We've seen um, the Daily Mail. Oh dear, quoted in the Daily Mail, my children have now left home permanently. Um, <laughs> You know, the stuff that sites are up to, doubling prices and stuff, you know, it, this is going to have a poor legacy on our sector next year when, when you know, the press remind us that we doubled the price during, you know, the boom times and they advertise weekend weeks for four in Spain for 800 quid, including the flights. You know, we've got such a great value proposition and we can do such a safe proposition. We should be focusing on, 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 on that, I think. Um, we do say in the guidelines, you know, how you can do the, the protocols, how you can clean within the prescribed changeover time from 10 till 4. You can extend your changeover time by saying they have to leave at 9.30 and not arrive until 4.30 if you need another hour. But by now, we should all be able to do a proper managed changeover and, as Beth said, optimise the revenue. OK, um, what, what else have we got coming in here as far as... Uh, we've got one from Anna. Are owners accepting six individuals in small cottages in midsummer? Um, well, the rule of six sort of suggests that you can have six people from different households. Again, the question, the answer to the question from DCMS is not the full answer to the question, but we will persist in making sure we get the detail. I would take a rule of six booking from the seventeenth of May. I bet travel chapter would. I bet yeah. both. Um, I would also take a two households booking from the 17th of May. Um, I would do reasonable due diligence. I am not the Stasi, okay? You know, reasonable due diligence means just that. You know, we are not in any way capable of uh, being MI5. If, if it's the same with the tier laws, when people were trying to track down where people lived. If somebody wanted to go on holiday in Cornwall, and Cornwall was the only tier one place apart from the Isle of Wight, the only place you could go on Cornwall, to Cornwall from was from Cornwall. So you just registered on the booking form in Super Control that you lived in Cornwall. And then the host had no means of dealing with it. It's not, you're not going to get criminally prosecuted unless you behave in a criminal manner. So due diligence is the answer on that. Um, what have we got down here coming in? Last questions. What is a household bubble? The definition of it is on the PASC Facebook page. It's quite complicated because it's written by Her Majesty's government, but you can get your head around it after you read it three times. But it doesn't mean you can just make a bubble with somebody that you want to. When you make a bubble, it's a pretty permanent thing. It would be like if you had a grandfather who was living alone, he's over 18, he lives alone, you could bring him into a bubble and he would have been in your bubble for COVID and you could go on holiday with him. You can't reunite with your bestie from university. Okay, that's not, that's not how it works. All right. Questions on new rules. Is it down to owners to police this again? Uh, or is it a legal obligation? You know, if, if you have a group of 30 inside, you're going to get fined. Um, but if you take reasonable steps, and I bet you've got all kinds of reasonable steps at Travel Chapter and at Kernet, just to make sure that you're not tripping yourself up. Um, the guests will try anything to get around this. Let's face it, we're, there's people out there laughing at this point. We've had some outrageous attempts at bookings over the last year. So that's why you need to do reasonable due diligence. But again, reasonable, you're not the Stasi. Um, we've covered 72 hours. Um, Babies and children. Yeah. Um, even they after, are people. Even after the removal of masks. I've got a couple, a lot of questions have come in this last couple of weeks from past um, members and newsletter readers saying, will we be uh, changing the protocols so that it's easier to clean and removing the need to take things out and removing them? Uh, no, we will be reviewing them, but I doubt that we will be reducing the requirement to clean. We've got open again this time and we've got open now because we're taken seriously as a sector. No other sector can show they've had, you know, 120,000 cleaning protocols downloaded and that it's been widely used and it's on three government websites you know we've earned that every single one of you's earned that right and we're not going to suddenly say you know forget the virus side and so it's not going to happen we are going to keep cleaning and i would say to you that a key message this summer is that when you have guests coming they know that you have cleaned it properly 
that your cleaning staff have done it properly. This will be a big plus in your favor that you do it properly. The most common complaint coming into PASC last summer from the public finding PASC on the website, oh God, what a pain that was, was I stayed in a cottage that wasn't properly COVID cleaned by your protocols. What are you gonna do about it? You know, so you, you, this has got to be taken seriously this summer. This is the summer to prove that we can do stuff properly. Um, some of the guys do I think they need to be adhered to? Yes, I think they're going to need to be adhered to until COVID uh, is only mentioned once a week on the news. Uh, uh, and that'll be, you know, that'll be end of 2021 at the earliest that we will be thinking about reducing the protocols. Um, when can we put um, games and books back in? Well, you know, what I would say about games and books is... Um, it's, there's not a great deal of evidence that it hangs about on these things. You know, if you've got a monopoly set and you wipe the outside of it and they haven't been in it for, or they obviously haven't used it, or you put a piece of tape over it to see, there's a million ways that you can operate these things to see if people have used them and whether you need to rotate them. I think, you know, you can get overly paranoid about the contacts on things like this but i think things like guest books it was time for them to go anyway they're out of date you need to have something like my stay planner or touch stay you know guest books are so history it's 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 got to, they've got to go so you know take the practical steps this is a risk you do a risk assessment proportionate to the risk of your business not you know you're not trying to operate an intensive care theater in your cottage you've got to get the balance right um, and, and unbelievably well done all last year across the sector on that. Um, after we change, our, after 21st of June, do we change our guest charter? I think what that question is asking is be about things like uh, pool rotors. If that's not the question that you're asking, put another question up and we'll answer it. I don't think you will have to have a, a rotor on the pool from the 21st of June, but I would ask you to all think about how much your guests enjoyed exclusive use of the pool if you're able to continue to offer it. At Higher Wiscombe, we have always had exclusive use slots of the pool because we have a sleeps 20 and two sleep sixes. And if there's a nice couple trying to teach their baby to swim from one of the small cottages and 10 teenagers come from the big one and start pl playing bombs in the pool, it's not a compatible experience. So we have always done uh, two and a half, three hours a day exclusive to each pool on rotating slots and we will continue to do that forever here at Higher Wiscombe. It works, the guests love it, they love having the pool exclusively but again each business makes its own choice. You may have 20 cottages and one pool and that would you'd like to get it back to being open and that's entirely your call from the 21st of June. Um, moving down, we, I think we've covered some of the cleaning stuff. Are we handling Pre-April 12th cancellations, noting CMA refunding advice. Okay, here we go, Jody. What are you doing at Travel Chapter with cancellations that can no longer go ahead for the weeks coming up to the 12th of April? What's what's your? Yeah, uh, I, I think we adopted a, a, a policy quite early on, in, even in the first lockdown, um, of trying to balance both the owners and the the guests, the customers' interests. So where possible looking for that, that guest to transfer their booking to a later date so they can fulfill it, enjoy it. And obviously that helps the owner out as well. But where a, a booking cannot happen legally, be it the guest cannot legally travel or the property is legally shut, we will offer a full refund. Um, and that's the entirety. That's the commission, the booking fee, the works. We will offer a full refund. And that's the position of any booking up to that April the 12th period right now. Brilliant. Absolutely applaud you. What's your view, Beth? What, what would you be doing as a direct booker? Um, yes, we've uh, absolutely refunded. Um, I have actually discouraged um, those guests who were very keen to be really helpful and just wanted to shift their booking to next year because if they booked originally at 2020 prices for Easter, which got moved to 21, uh, and they now want to move to 22, they expect it to be at the 2020 price. And quite frankly, uh, that is not to my advantage. So I've just been saying, have all your money back, no problem at all. Okay, I, don't, I don't want to shift over at last year's prices, so. Robert, you, you concur with that? 
Yeah, I do. And I think that this is, uh, we've talked about it before, and, and Pass has got an excellent paper on terms and conditions, which you all should review. But this is, there's going to be many changes, permanent changes to our sector following COVID and uh, flexibility of cancellation terms is going to be one of them. Our guests uh, are, are going to continue to demand that. And we've all, or, or most of us have seen the benefit of doing it. It builds a great relationship with the guest and, and the risks uh, are not as great as perhaps we feared previously. So more flexibility is something that we will have for the long term. Okay, all right. Um, we have four properties that share a laundry room. Can we open the laundry room on the 12th of April? I will double check that and put that in the... Um, FAQs uh, in the newsletter on Friday. I fear not. I fear that the shared facilities are not allowed. And the way that you make a pool safe is because a pool is quite a safe environment anyway, um, because it's in chlorine, and that's very good for, for COVID. I think that this is why the B&B guys are having a riot, because any kind of shared facilities are closed until the 17th of May. But I will check on laundries. On that point, Alistair, we've, we've, we've made a point of actually notifying any guests with bookings up from that period from April the 12th to May the 17th, if there are shared facilities, that they will be closed. Yeah. So we, we've taken that and adopted that position quite early on um, to make guests aware that um, that will be the case. Okay, I will put, um, I'll put the icons and all the bits from the roadmap in the past newsletter on Friday, um, and it will cover some more of this in some detail. Um, there's, there's, a quote, there's another slightly related question there from Louise, who's saying in regard to guests who want to cancel after the 12th due to the group not being able to mix, i.e. two separate households, um, it, it comes back again to um, you know, there is so much demand at the moment. If you've got guests between the 12th of April and the 17th of May who you feel may not um, meet the criteria, do not wait until, until the week before for them to confirm ask them proactively if uh, they want to cancel because you, if you do it now you will replace that booking and it and, and you won't have a problem if you wait until the week before and then go oh if you're two households you can't come uh, don't expect them not to kick off for not getting their money back and i i think we're back into a post 12th of april phase where much as you might not want to cancel them and refund them if they want to be refunded that the demand will be high enough for you to rebook. Uh, I spoke to a complex in Cornwall yesterday who was very nervous about cancelling uh, multiple households after the 12th of May, saying, you know, well, it's not my fault that, you know, the rules came in, they booked, they should still pay for it. I said, don't, don't get into that argument. You'll probably lose in court and make it available. And an email from her this morning, she cancelled four yesterday, gave them their money back, and she's booked three overnight. And she's happy as Larry because she's got £120 more for each booking. You know, I think you have to be confident and I think you have to realise what you'd win in court and what you'd lose. If that group can't legally come because of restrictions, you're not going to win that one in court, whatever your terms and conditions say. Mm -hmm. We would, though, say, again, that we do not accept what it says in the CMA guidelines about uh, guests having to self-isolate because they have caught COVID. We do not accept and we will not accept that as a risk that you all have to wear. So you put in your two, we've covered it in the cancellations thing. You make it clear, as we said in the cancellations webinar, in the cancellations paper, that's down to them. They can buy high street insurance to protect themselves against getting COVID. We have no control of them getting COVID any more than them getting flu, and not wanting to come or breaking a leg. They can cover that on their insurance. We'll have to cover the big risk, but they can cover the ones of uh, um, poor mixing. So uh, just to cover that again, um, when you someone up here has asked, is sorry, they they is guest and right. So I don't, I don't. Uh, Annabelle, can you type that one again? I, do, I don't understand the question. Um, Hannah Evans has said we have a large self catering uh, property. Uh, we're licensed. Weddings and receptions can take place in early June, and you have a wedding wedding book. Can thirty guests stay? There is no wangle that we have found that you can get more than two households into self-contained accommodation, whether or not it has a wedding license or not, before the 20, Monday, the 21st of June, I'm afraid. That, that is, that's not going to happen. I mean, the weddings people are incensed about the roadmap because you go from 
30 people on the 20th of June to 500 people on the 21st. I mean, it, it you know, sometimes the guidelines are rubbish. Um, what have we got here? Uh, do the rule only... Right, Vicky's asked if, if two households wanting to stay to attend a course, if it's genuinely work, and you've really got to be careful with this one because there's some wild abusers out there. If it's genuinely work, they can come and stay in the work size, but you've really got to be careful with this one. Uh, this is not an excuse for a belated Christmas party, otherwise you'll find yourself in a world of pain. So, be, you know, again, uh, have a look on, um, I'll try and put the, uh, who can stay i put it i do i put this in the newsletter all the time who can come and stay um and i'll put it again so who can come and stay i'll put it in friday's newsletter will track and trace qr code system still be in place do you know i don't know uh, i don't know i don't think it worked terribly well last year i think people said oh my phone's not working and i'm not going to do it for fear of being track and traced and i think the vaccine may well have overhauled it um so i don't i i, I don't know a quick update on the issue of shared uh, apartments. Where can I start here? Um, our interpretation, I said at the beginning, is that if you have uh, apartments with a shared entrance, um, that you would be able to open them as long as the entrance has um, risk assessed, proper risk assessment and cleaning stations on either side. Having said that, the residence groups are going nuts out there. I could, I, I'm not going to put the video up on pass because it'll just help it go viral but BBC last night covered the fact that you shouldn't do this so uh, we've got a battle royal going on between residents groups who are saying no and owners who want to open and I cannot predict today which way that's going to open our interpretation is with a risk assessment cleaning stations on either side you should be allowed to if the if the accommodation inside is each individually self-contained so there's no shared cooking areas shared bathing areas it's the shared areas that that, that cause businesses to have to remain closed on the 12th of april um what else so i've done that done that done that um glamping site i'm afraid we still think you know got our glamping site with private showers uh if you've got a glamping site that's you know each each unit has got its own um private um uh, washing cooking areas you're fine that's self-contained accommodation if you've got say five pods and a shared shower block and a shared cooking block that can't open on the 12th i'm afraid that's our understanding um i think we're moving towards the end of the questions Again, I've got feedback here. Uh, guests love the pool rotor, likely to continue. Same here, work really well. I mean, it makes them feel special. They got the pool exclusively. It's a really nice one. Um, super control e-vouchers have been a great asset. Yes, I've heard that many times, uh, Robert, and all the steps that you put into place to help with moving bookings forwards. Um, should we go ahead with a booking for the 12th of April, if there are two households booking separate accommodation who know each other in case they breach COVID guidelines. Well, that's an interesting one. Um, obviously they're going to breach the guidelines, but you're not the police. So as long as you've done your due diligence and you're not saying, just tell me you're gonna to stick to the rules. Um, yes, of course, that they can meet in the garden uh, after the uh, 12th of April, they can meet outside, they can go outside and they can sit outside in a pub under a tarpaulin. You know, I don't think you should be overly restricting yourself, but there are enough bookings out there for you. If you think something's dodgy, pass it up. There'll be someone else who comes who'll be much more compliant, would be uh, my advice. Um, I know it doesn't sound fair that if you clean and sanitize your laundry room that you can't open it. Um, uh, uh, it I will check on the laundry room rules. I, I know it's unfair, but they may just have to bring enough laundry with them that week and, and not use your laundry facilities. You know, you want to get open and you want to get the income. And as long as you explain that they won't be open to the guests, as Jane, as Joby was saying, they've done, you know, you're, you're setting the bar so it's not a reason to complain when they come. Uh, that's what that's what uh, we would do there. Um, uh, 
Well, there's a really nice thing to, to, to end on. Uh, we joined Super Control in July last year. Every day since then, we have said, thank goodness, it has made life a bit safer along with past membership. And I can't tell you how much that uh, means to us. So we are five minutes over. We've tried to get through all of those questions. I will put about laundries, pools, who can come and stay in the newsletter on Friday. Um, I'd very, very much like to thank Robert for hosting again a Super Control. They do this for us. It, it's, it saves us a huge amount of work. We're hugely grateful to the support we get from them. Travel Chapter, PASC Associate Member, thank you very much indeed for doing it so openly and, and neutrally. That was brilliant. Thank you. We appreciate that. Beth, thank you for your expertise as always. And we'll sign off now saying good luck with getting those bookings, sorting those cancellations and to a buoyant, profitable summer. Thank you very much indeed. Bye. Thank you.